Um, so what's the, or if you look at the bigger picture landscape of kind of SDN-ish things, what we had for a long time, we had our network OS layer, we had virtual devices, we had physical devices, and these devices were all based, or are based in most of the cases, on a piece of open source software, which is Linux. Do we ever talk about that? No, we don't. But it's the fundamental integration layer for almost everything we do in the network layer. ASR 1000 runs Linux. Nexus runs Linux. But yeah, well, we do the glorification, the beautification on top. Um, so the smarts are typically in the network OS. That doesn't mean that we're not investing a hell load of stuff into the base operating system. Cisco is still the 25th largest contributor to the Linux kernel. Why? Well, it's a base layer. It's an industry base layer that we're maturing. Now, with the arrival of SDN, there was the arrival of something that I call infrastructure software um, that helps us orchestrate stuff across multiple devices, pull multiple devices together, and help with things like managing virtualization. Again, at that layer, similar to what you had at the device layer, a base layer of functions emerged that are quote unquote hard problems everybody has to solve, everybody has to have a VM manager, everybody has to piece together network functions, everybody has to have a translation layer for network protocols into one another. Well, and if it's a hard problem, it's a repetitive effort in the industry, and it doesn't really allow you for a load of differentiation, it's a great starting point for open source. So hard work, common problem, low on IP, great for open source. So you've seen projects emerging like Open Daylight, loads of things on display as a generic SDN or network controller. You've seen OpenStack evolving as a generic piece of software to, do, to allow for VM management. Now, if you want to run your network functions and piece them together, yeah, there's loads of stuff that you can run on top. But what we discovered is integrating these individual pieces in open source, like Open Daylight, like OpenStack, it's not easily done. It's an art. It's a bit of an art. But again, piecing the thing together, getting OpenStack to deploy to bare metal with HA, integrating Open Daylight as an SDN controller, it's really hard. And it's a repetitive task in the industry. So we have to solve it at Cisco. HP has to solve it. Juniper has to solve it. Ericsson has to solve it. AT&T as a service provider have to solve it. Orange as a service provider have to solve it. NTT has to solve it as a service provider. Highly repetitive across the industry. Is there real differentiation at that layer once you piece it together? No, the differentiation is in the virtual network functions. It is in the services that you run. So let's not do it over and over and over again. And by the way, you need to do that every six months, because every six months there is a new release from Open Daylight. There is a new release from OpenStack. Let's try to do this once together in the industry as, an, as, a, as one effort. So it's systems integration in the open. That's what OPNFE tries to do. It's not really a natural open source project as it's co-producing open source. It's integration producing open source. So what we do is scripting, clobbling things together, getting things installed in a consistent way so that we solve a hard problem no longer in a repetitive way, but that problem is low on IP, which is great for multiple vendors and service providers coming together to solve that thing. So it's industry-led uh, community um, open uh, <clears throat> integration. And if you look at the overall crowd of people, you'll find almost every interesting or name that you would expect on the set of members uh, that participate in OPNFE. And it's ki kind of non-typical for an open source project to have a mix of not only vendors or systems integrators, but also service providers. And that's a great thing, because given that it's systems integration, you have to have somebody who keeps you honest. What is the target that we're integrating towards? We typically integrate towards the needs of a specific market deployment. And that's what the service providers give us. And they push us towards a certain thing. 
So this mix of vendors and service providers works really well for that particular niche, which is systems integration. And if you look at the project infrastructure in OPNFE, it really represents this. They have projects that are focused on requirements, and we retrieve the requirements not only necessarily from the members, but also upstream sources like, well, Etsy predominantly. We have a code producing upstream community that is Open Daylight, KVM, Open vSwitch as a virtual forwarder, um, and OpenStack. And well, OPNFV then takes care of the integration piece. So it's three different domains meeting the code producing side, the requirements producing side, and the integration and testing side. And well, the desired outcome is that we can systems integrate the entire uh, thing over and over and over again on a continuous basis, day by day by day by day, so that we find out if things break at systems integration layer really quickly. So today, if you contribute to Open Daylight, you contribute a patch, it's getting integrated, you run it through local function testing. And then, yeah, all green, fine. Later on, maybe six months down the line, somebody then starts to use this version of Open Daylight with OpenStack, tries to get it run together, and it fails six months down the line. What we want to go do is you push a patch, we pull it in OPNFV, we deploy the thing, we test the thing, and we can tell you 24 hours later after you pushing the patch, you broke something at system layer. So that means we can mature the thing far, far faster than what happens today, where local testing, because you're in your silo, you're in your open source silo here, you're in your open source silo here, we cut across the silos and make sure that things work at system level. So we invest a fair amount of time, not only into the integration piece, but also into a tool chain that allows for continuous deployment, continuous deployment to bare metal hardware, and continuous testing and the, the feedback loop. So OPNFV invested into lab infrastructure quite a bit worldwide with the reference lab living in the Linux Foundation, because it's a project under the Linux Foundation. And well, guess what? It runs UCSB hardware. So it's Cisco bags. What is the focus of OPNFV? If you look at the Etsy architecture that you might be familiar with, you have a base layer. And on that base layer, you're running virtual network functions and the orchestration further up. The starting point for OPNFV was the base layer. And that makes total, point of, uh, total sense. There is loads of differentiation in the virtual network functions like virtual firewalls, virtual load balancers, what have you. Are you able to do that as open source? Absolutely not, because it's high on IP. But this base layer is low on IP. It's just hard work, highly repetitive, get it done as a community as opposed to highly repetitive in every single company over and over again. So assembling the thing. When we pull together OPNFV, it means you have a bunch of Lego blocks, and it was us to choose a starting point. And I led the project in OPNFV called Bootstrap Get Started that has done kind of the initial choosing of componentry that we initially integrated together and then created this, well, spinning wheel of a continuous integration cycle. Well, piecing the thing together is a little bit like following the Unix philosophy. And you probably all do know Doc McIlroy. Um, he said, well, write little things that do things well and then piece them together, componentize, and have them interworking across open APIs so that you have a componentry and you can replace individual components for each other if you want, say, change system behavior or when you harden, harden system behavior, but you're not, never ever breaking the entire system. You can, well, componentize things quite nicely. Another thing that is attributed to Doug is this statement, do one thing and do it well. So when we had to pick a starting point for OPNFV, there was nothing. And the most important thing for a project to get started is to build a foundation that you can then, say, build variety upon. But that starting point, I try to constrain as much as possible. So we picked something and said, well, the main objective for day one is allow us to run a VNF for real. 
and for real means with predictable performance deployed to bare metal. Validate it, allow at least for functional testing and functional verification, repeatable, make the whole thing so that you can automate it all the time so you can really give the 24 uh, four hour feedback uh, cycle and carry a class. So make sure that the components that you can build in high availability are high avail uh, highly available. So that gave us the, the set of things that we wanted to go get started with. And then we had to pick and choose from what is there. So you need VM control and a hypervisor. You need something for storage. You need something to store images, have virtual disks. You need network control and a virtual folder. That's the base infra that you need. And then you need something to connect these components. You need a message bus. You need cluster communications. You need something for HA. And then you need something to help operate your things. Given the most interest is in components from OpenStack and Open Daylight, we picked components from OpenStack, Open Daylight. We picked KVM as a hypervisor. We picked Open vSwitch. So that's the initial set of components that we've chosen to go start the integration with. It's the starting point. It's not the ending point. If somebody says, well, let me go switch one of those for something else, that will absolutely happen. Will individual vendors switch a component for something else? Absolutely. Is there optimized versions of opti uh, OP, uh, Open vSwitch? Absolutely. So you'll probably see the reference design done with OBS. But Cisco will switch over for VPP and have that working in the lab right now. And then, once you have this, you need to go build this into this spinning wheel of a continuous integration cycle. So piece it together, get it deployed. So build an image that deploys all these individual components to reference infrastructure. And we have one piece of main reference infrastructure in the Linux Foundation. But another interesting thing that we follow in OPNFV is the concept of, well, field or vendor deployment labs. So we cannot only deploy to the reference lab in the Linux Foundation, we can also deploy to other vendor labs that donated equipment to the Linux Foundation or OPNFV as a project to run their stuff on. So Ericsson has such a donated lab, Intel has such a donated lab. So we're not only deploying to that infrastructure, we're deploying to multiple labs. And guess what that gives us? A variety of test infrastructure to run our system again and harden it further. So you can run, once you have the stuff installed, you can run against uh, the reference labs, and well, you learn from it. And the main objective for us is not to have everything green. The main objective for us is to fail things so that we can improve on what the indi individual componentry here delivers. Because all of these guys work in silos, work in isolation. They never ever piece things together for NFV. They piece things together for something, but not for NFV. So deploy the thing. What can you do with it? You got to be prepared. What, do you, what hardware do you need to run on? Where do you run OPNFV? That's the lab question, right? What software to install, where to pick it from? I'll show you real quick. And then, well, you're ready to run your own virtual firewall, virtual load balancer, virtual router, what have you. Their lab infrastructure, again, is a very constrained system right now. We deploy the bare metal. So we've chosen a setup for bare metal. And we said, well, what's the minimum really redundant setup for control nodes, three control nodes? What's a reasonable number for compute nodes so that you at least have two systems talk to each other? Well, that's two. So that, well, one guy can talk to another guy, both deploy to, uh, deploy to bare metal. So we're at five systems already. And then, well, you need something to install the system from. You need a jump post. That's six. And that's the minimum setup. So we decided to build it upon that. As I said, the lab in, or the reference lab in the Linux Foundation is a setup based on UCSB. Um, and well, in addition, we don't take a load of assumptions on that. There's a certain networking infrastructure or layout that we require, and we require that there is no DHCP running so that we can bring our DHCP up. And that we can pixie boot the, the, the nodes, of course. Deploying the thing means, even for, for us today, we deploy to the main Linux Foundation lab. You can hook other labs up with your Jenkins uh, systems as a Jenkins slave. But we also have sandboxes worldwide donated by vendors. As I said, Intel donated a bunch of pods as sandboxes where we can go and, well, deploy and run and test and what have you. 
So if you say, I don't have six nodes available in my lab, go try on the Intel lab or go try on the Ericsson lab. So that's awesome. And we're hoping that more vendors, more vendors announce their, their willingness to go and participate so that over time, we'll have a bunch of sandboxes worldwide and you go, I want to go test on hardware infrastructure ABC. So run and say a test on a UCSC. Well, you'll go pick this lab. Or you run a run on, want to run on a white-labeled Intel box? Well, you run on the Intel lab and so forth. So it's community labs, which is another new thing that o OPNFE pioneered. If you want to go deploy things today, if you go to the, the OPNFE website, the main deployment option is you pull down a bootable disk image in ISO and get the jump post installed. And the jump post then drives the installation automatically to all the servers that are connected if you have the right layout in place. If you say, well, I don't want to download gigabytes and gigabytes, then there is a deploy script which pulls the stuff from upstream uh, directly. So you can also deploy the stuff. So in the Linux Foundation, we obviously don't install ISOs. We use the deploy script to pull from upstream sources and upstream resource, uh, 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 repos um, immediately. And then we run test. From a testing perspective, it's verification testing, it's benchmarking, and the generation of the reports. And initially, again, we put the, the carpet into the room rather than do anything so sophisticated. So what we run is the basic rally test suite of OpenStack, basic Tempest smoke testing, and robot testing for ODL. Um, so that's the main things that we run. And on top of this, we have a really, really simple test that OPNFE does, which is bringing up two machines and pinging each other. Automated. Um, on top of this, and I'm going to go show you in a minute, um, Cisco did something like, oh, bring up a CRS-1000V, bring up a couple of VMs, and make them ping each other. Yeah, you can play with that. Uh, but once you have the carpet in the room, you can start to modify these scripts and say, OK, let me do this or let me do that. But that's the starting point. So yeah, you can run Rally. You can run Robert. You've seen that. Um, so if you want to run your own stuff, well, you create yourself a, uh, a volume. You make sure that you have uh, keys available to go and connect to the VM later on. So you generate yourself a, a pair of keys. Um, you pick a VNF, so CSR 1000V, for instance, to go and run. You create the tenant network maybe through uh, the, the Horizon uh, dashboard. You kick the VNF to be started. Um, once it's started, you can check on that either through Horizon as a dashboard or say something like Nova List. And then you check the connectivity. And well, you can do that real quick. We did that in the lab yesterday here. Um, I brought up one instance of a CSR 1000V and I brought, brought up two instances of CentOS on two different networks and well, if you bring it up, and after a while, you can do, ah, well, you look at the router configuration, it runs, and you can ping each other. Awesome. That's what OPNFE does. Now, you can ask yourself, what is in it for me? Yes, you can bring up a VNF. Now you have a, a base layer of o integration between OpenStack and, and uh, and, and, and open daylight, but it might not do exactly what you want, or it might not do what you want yet. So how can you take influence to OPNFE so that OPNFE at one point runs your test cases, runs your use cases, and not this kind of, well, Frank brought up three VMs, one is a CRSL 1000V 1000, uh, 1000 and two CentOS 7 systems and they ping each other. I'm not really interested in that. Maybe I'm interested in bringing up a virtual IMS system and testing that towards uh, OPNFE. How you can take influence is by extending this overall cycle and adding the kind of your view to it. So you can run VNFs. You can add your component. Say I, you can switch from using OVS to using VPP. You can switch from using standard plain vanilla open daylight to using Cisco's hardened version of this, uh, the, the open SDN controller, I believe we call it, right? And um, but more importantly and more interestingly, at least from my perspective, is you can feed OPNFE your test cases. And if you feed OPNFE your test cases, give them to OPNFE, so to us, 
S Tempest scenario tests. That makes it real easy for us to run them. And if you don't want to do Tempest scenario tests, you can give us robot scenario tests. Again, we can run that against our system. And that way, yeah, you influence the test behavior. But well, if your tests are not green, these guys upstream will notice. And then you say, oh, yeah, well, I need to go tweak that component in order to make it work. So for instance, in the current release, we rely on Open Daylight Helium. And Open Daylight Helium has a bunch of bugs in the plugin towards Neutron OpenStack. So you can create networks, but you can't remove networks. And that bug has been kind of lurking around for quite some time. And well, now it's kind of in everybody's mind, because the OPNFE tests all go red that test this. It's fixed in lithium, by the way. But um, still, it gets major attention by a far bigger amount of people. And obviously, you can also write requirements documents to go feed that into the cycle. Real quick, um, if you want to go participate in the test cycle, there is nothing stopping you, and there's even documentation on that, bringing up your own lab. It can be your own private lab. You hook up your Jenkins, make it a slave of the OPNFE master, and you can deploy as often as OPNFE deploys every 24 hours. So you can get the latest and greatest automatically whenever you want. And if you look at what we do right now, there's even labs from at and I think the print is a little too small here, but if you get the slides, you can read it. Um, the at and lab, for instance, they are getting this stuff shuffled across uh, every 24 hours and a couple of other labs. I already alluded to the fact that we can switch individual components. So if you don't like Cinder, you can take Solid Fire and play with that, because it's componentized. It's Lego blocks. Remember Doug McGilroy. And well, as I said, the main reason I'm, I'm trying to advocate for is get your test scripts integrated into OPNFE. The minute you do this, OPNFE does your stuff forever, every 24 hours. And if sometime in the future we deviate from your tests no longer run green, but they suddenly become red, somebody will very likely take care of it really quickly without you even articulating anything. Because, well, automation tells you, I, d I broke something, let's go, let me fix it, rather than I need to wait six months to have somebody fix it for me. And the final thing is obviously you can do it the, say, a little bit long-term way. There's lots of people that engage, especially carriers, in writing requirements documents with the hope that somebody picks that up. Um, that's good and bad. It articulates a lot of nice little use cases, but a Word document or what have you, or a wiki, always means a human needs to interpret that and gets that put into code so that it's a proper test case. It's far nicer if you do the articulation directly as code because that's what OPNFE really understands, and that's what a developer really understands, as opposed to, I have this requirement that the system may or should, or, yeah, you got it, right? Um, so closing thoughts. We got the release out. If you go to www.opnfe.org slash Arno. Arno is a river in Italy, in Tuscany. Um, you uh, find all the glory about the first release, so the links to the ISOs, the documentation, and what have you. Uh, OPNFE names the releases after river, so A, first river. We're discussing right now what the B river name will be. Uh, there's not too many B rivers, but well, fine. What we've done for Arno is really put the carpet into the room. We're ready to put the furniture based on your test cases. We really put the carpet in based on this do one thing at a time and do it well. Very restricted set of componentry, very restricted hardware. We will branch out and do more diversity moving forward. But we have a foundation that we can stand on. And we have our integration chain working out. So the cycle that gives us feedback in a 24-hour cycle is up and running, and it works every night or every day, depending on where you are. Here is a concern. Integration is still an art. And given that integration is still an art, there is this, well, 
debate that we have between us, like how much can we make this a commodity versus how much customization can we still allow for? And it's a fine line to walk. Because there's people that work in OPNFV that make their living out of doing systems integration in a customized way. But I do believe everybody participating in open source and in, in OPNFE specifically agrees that there is a plumbing layer and there, there is a layer where you can really differentiate. And let's first get the plumbing layer right and do it together in the open um, so that, well, we don't really spend an enormous amount of money in the industry to get the plumbing right by doing it in a repetitive way but rather try to get NFV out the door real quickly, get the benefits of art, uh, NFV articulated, and don't spend a super amount of money on the plumbing infrastructure. So it's also a cost-cutting exercise, exercise long-term. But it's a bit of a double-edged sword um, that we have to work a really fine line on. And, um, well, I can really hope that systems integration as a approach focused on merit can really work out longer term. It's the first time ever that systems integration is tried as a community effort, and I'm hoping for all your support to move us forward, give us our test cases that will mature OPNFE faster than anything else. Thank you so much. Any questions, come and see me. Uh, I think the next speaker needs to go and get ready here because we're on this we deploy every half an hour, right?